Okay, so just for something a little bit different, um, I want to talk a little bit about history and um, particularly two individuals that are sometimes, well, at least on Wikipedia and in a few other sources, very, very occasionally considered to be British prime ministers. Now, before I talk about these two individuals, and uh, I should emphasize the academic consensus on them actually being prime ministers is very, very limited. So by most records, these two gentlemen were not prime ministers. Nevertheless, it is interesting, um, and it is worth noting that at this time, I'm talking the mid-18th century, the concept of prime minister was not an established office. So just to give a little bit of background about the development of the role of prime minister. Traditionally, there had been first lords of the treasury going uh, back some time, uh, several centuries, the Lord High Chancellor was usually the most powerful uh, minister in government. And until the Glorious Revolution in 1688, the head of state was not only the head of state, but also the king or queen would have been um, essentially the head of government as well. Um, we had absolute monarchy before the Glorious Revolution. So today, whilst it's largely a formality, um, that's not to say that the queen has no influence, but it is largely... A formality whereas whereby the Queen is head of state and the Prime Minister is head of government. In those days the Prime Minister was not even an established office so it's not like um, President of the United States whereby it was established by the American Constitution. It was a role that sort of came about actually initially as an insult. Um, you are the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister. It was sort of seen as an insult. It wasn't until 1905 under Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman that the the office was finally formalised as a as a role in itself, although essentially the term had been used before that. Um, as it stands, we have had 54 prime ministers, including Theresa May, but some accounts because this office was never set up, it's not universally accepted that Sir Robert Walpole was the first Prime Minister. Most regard Walpole as the first Prime Minister, but that is more by essence of the fact that he sort of consolidated the government of the time. For a long time, beginning in the late 17th century, going well into the 18th century, there were two offices uh, known as the Secretary of the Northern Department and the Secretary of the Southern Department, and these basically divided up the, the then British Empire. Um, the Southern Department was the more powerful of the two, but basically the various governments would be dominated by either the Secretary of the Northern Department or the Secretary of the Southern Department. One example was uh, the Earl of Sunderland. Um, Viscount Townsend was another. So these men could well have a claim to being early Prime Ministers as well, and they were very powerful figures in government. There is two figures, though, um, who came after Walpole, who, by virtue of the situation that they found themselves in, may just be able to call themselves prime ministers, or at least be known to history as prime ministers. But I'll let you make your own judgment. So, um, Sir Robert Walpole is generally considered to have been prime minister between 1721 and 1742 which makes him also the longest serving Prime Minister. Um, now, what happened was in 1746, uh, during the administration of Henry Pelham, the Pelham administration basically collapsed and resigned en masse. So for a very brief period in 1746, uh, Pelham had been in power for three years. For a very brief, brief period in 1746, the king turned to uh, the Earl of Bath um, to see if he would form a government. Now, he actually went through the formalities. He took the official um, ceremonial uh, documents, uh, the Grand Seal, all this sort of thing, and he attempted to form a government, but he couldn't form a government and Pelham came back. So... Whether or not the Earl of Bath can be considered a Prime Minister or not, in fact, it was timed to 48 hours and so many uh, minutes and seconds. It went right down to that. So that's the first individual who might 
be considered a prime minister. Actually, in 1743, he had been ambitious. He had hoped that the king would appoint him prime minister. These, these were the days well before democracy as we know it today, long before the Great Reform Act of 1832. Um, so by virtue of those two days, it's a matter of debate whether we consider the Earl of Bath uh, would be the fourth prime minister. And then Pelham came back, but most records don't show that. They show Pelham as being in office from 1743 straight through to 1754, and that little uh, interregnum is not included. The second period was 1757. This was uh, during the premiership of the Duke of Newcastle, who's generally considered a very weak prime minister. The real power in government was considered to be William Pitt the Elder. He himself was prime minister between 1766 and 1768, but in truth he had been a very influential figure long before then. then that's why Pitt the Elder is such a well-known figure in contrast to the Duke of Newcastle. Uh, I should emphasise that is the belief fourth Duke of Newcastle. The uh, titles at this time sometimes get confusing. Anyway, um, that government collapsed and the king turned to one Earl Waldegrave or Lord Waldegrave um, to form a government. Now, Waldegrave did again put together or tried to put together a government for four days in this period in June 1757, but never quite transpired. But the problem is, because the role of prime minister has never been put in our constitution, it, v it really is a matter of debate as to whether these two men can really be called prime minister. The Earl of Bath by virtue of his two days, or the Earl of Waldegrave by virtue of his four days. But, you know, people can form their own judgment. I personally think that their period was so brief that it is difficult to really consider them to have been prime ministers. Um, but the role itself is, like I say, never an established office. Essentially, the first modern prime minister in the sense of being after the Great Reform Act or during the Great Reform Act was Lord Grey, um, Charles Grey, second Earl Grey, Earl Grey, as he's well known, uh, famous for Bergamo tea and famous for the Great Reform Act. And he's generally respected as one of our top prime ministers. So essentially, he is the first modern prime minister in that sense. If we consider Grey and not Walpole to be the first modern prime minister, then Theresa May is not the 54th prime minister but somewhere around the 30th or 35th, somewhere around that. So it's an interesting subject. Um, going way, way back, uh, every king would have had their top ministers, for example, under Henry VIII, um, and a lot of the medieval kings, the clergy held enormous power. Um, for example, when the boy king, uh, Edward VI, was on the throne, there was powerful figures like Lord Somerset, Lord Seymour, uh, who were Lord Protectors, and they were essentially the Prime Minister of the country. Um, likewise, under Henry VIII, Cardinal Wolsey, uh, there were powerful figures like Cardinal Wolsey, um, Moore, Henry Moore, um, Henry Moore, damn, I've forgotten his first name, but a very famous humanist scholar under King Henry VIII, um, damn. It's annoying, I've forgotten his first name now, but um, very famous clergyman. Anyway, in those days, they would have essentially been prime ministers um, and they had all the titles such as Lord Chancellor and so on. Today, the office of Lord Chancellor still exists, but it's less important than it was in those days. And the Lord Chancellor is actually Liz Truss, who is also the uh, Justice Minister. Nowadays, roles are often doubled up. Anyway, that's just a few thoughts about the two unknown prime ministers, Bath and Waldegrave, if indeed they were prime ministers.